Unsiloed podcast is produced by University FM, elevating the stories of your institution. Welcome to Unsiloed. This is uh, Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here today with uh, Brendan Ballou, who is uh, with the Department of Justice and also the author of, uh, I should say, U.S. Department of Justice, and the author of uh, this book, uh, Plunder, Private Equities Plan to Pillage America. Welcome, Brendan. Thank you so much for having me. Now, look, the title sounds like there's a there's a conspiracy out there, and so I, I don't want to accuse you of being a conspiracy theorist. But, you know, you make a lot of allusions to the Gilded Age, and you say that, you know, we're right now in the midst of a, of a second Gilded Age. And we all know that the Gilded Age also gave birth to, um, you know, Louis Brandeis and the kind of trust buster movement. And, um, of course, he's famous for writing that book, Other People's Money. And... And it seems like you're you're kind of following in his footsteps, um, you know, saying some of the things that Brandeis was saying in his day, where um, you know economic power is perhaps uh, too concentrated, and the the use of that power um, to influence the political system, you know, ultimately can be harmful. Um, but it, but it seems like you know you go well beyond this notion of of private equity, right? So while the book is crafted as a critique of private equity. I mean, you, you really have a lot to say about uh, the state of our bankruptcy laws, of our labor laws, of the, you know, the, the pension system, right, of, uh, you know, the lobbying system, right, uh, you, you know, our health care system. I mean, it seems like there are lots and lots of problems. And as one person in the book said, I forget who it was, who was a private equity partner, he said, you know, w- we don't make the rules. So, you know, is the problem really with private equity? I mean, because it seems like the only difference is that private equity is really, really good <laughs> at at, um, at what they do, right? Which is, you know, pushing profitability, right, to, to the limits of what's permissible within our, our legal system. So when you wrote this book, were, were you sort of initially focused on private equity or were you thinking that private equity serves as a, um, you know, a, a launch point for the critique of so much of our our economic regulatory system? It's a great question. And it actually did start out as a project specifically about private equity. I was working in the antitrust division of the Justice Department and was in sort of the depths of quarantine. And I was looking at when somebody, when one company wants to buy another company, they have to submit various documents to DOJ and to the FTC. And I was sort of looking at these documents and they were all all these acquisitions by, were by firms that I had never heard of, you know, probably familiar to you and your listeners, but, you know, not familiar to me, you know, Blackstone, Carlisle, Tama Bravo, you know, Vista Equity Partners, et cetera, et cetera. I had no idea what these firms were. Um, and, you know, with the abundant free time you have in quarantine, uh, I just started reading up on them and becoming fascinated. And I should say, of course, that I'm sort of, you know, I mentioned DOJ, I'm speaking in a purely personal capacity and the, my, my views don't necessarily represent those of my employer. Um, but that's something down on this path. And, and I agree with you in that, you know, this book is fairly critical of the private equity industry. I mean, it's right there in the subtitle. Um, but, uh, and, and in some sense, private equity is sort of an exemplar of larger trends that are happening in our society. You know, whether it's, as you said, problems in our bankruptcy code, problems in our healthcare system, problems in our labor laws, problems in our lobbying uh, laws. Um, and in some sense, private equity firms oftentimes are just sort of the most extreme version of that. But I do really try to make the case strongly that there's something unique about private equity. Um, because a lot of times when I talk with folks, you know, people who are supporters of private equity um, or people who are detractors basically say the same thing, which is that private equity is just sort of an extreme version of capitalism, you know, for better or for worse. And what I've been trying to say in this book and sort of in these conversations is actually it's not an extreme form of capitalism. It's sort of a deviation or or a perversion of capitalism by the specific laws and regulations that we have that incentivize short-term investing, reliance on debt, insulation from liability. We've sort of created these legal structures that allow certain people to capture sort of all the upside of our economy if things go well, but walk away if they don't. Now, of course, the alternative to private equity is public equity, right? And um, so, you know, we've seen certainly, uh, I think, a shift in uh, investment from, you know, public equity to private equity. I mean, there's always been privately owned 
corporations, right? You know, family companies and so forth. Um, but but this type of private ownership, right, through these you know limited partnerships and so forth. I mean, that's that's something which goes back to the 1980s, right? Like Kohlberg, Kravis, and and those guys. And it used to be called right leverage buyouts. <laughs> and then I remember I forget when it was, but there was like a rebranding that happened somewhere along the line. I was like, wait, is this the same thing? Is this a different thing, right? Because they kind of got a bad rap with Michael Milken and, and, and so forth. Um, but um, but do we really think that the the problems uh, of you know, private ownership are, are, are worse than the problems of public ownership. I mean, if we think about, you know, who are the worst offenders in today's world? I mean, who, all the tobacco companies are public, you know, all the big pharma companies are public, all the big oil companies are, you know, public. And so, you know, why would we think that private companies are going to be more harmful than, you know, publicly traded companies? Yeah, it's a great question. And, you know, a critique of private equity isn't necessarily praise of sort of our public capital markets. And I think that there's a lot of sort of structural issues that are getting worked through there. But I really do think that private equity as an institution is unique for three reasons. Uh, one is that private equity owners tend to invest for just a few years. So you're talking about a three, five, seven year time horizon. Two is that private equity firms tend to load up the companies they buy with a lot of debt and extract a lot of fees. So, and sort of the magic trick, as you probably know, of a lot of these private equity deals is when they load these companies up with debt uh, for the acquisition, it's the company that holds, holds the debt, not the private equity firm. So if things go badly, it's the company that's on the hook. It's not the private equity owners and investors. And then the third thing, and this is what really interests me as a lawyer, is private equity firms are enormously successful at insulating themselves legally from the consequences of their portfolio company's actions. So if something goes wrong at a portfolio company or someone is hurt or an, ex an employee is taken advantage of, whatever it happens to be, it's very hard to hold a private equity firm responsible. And so you have this sort of, um, you know, you're an economist, maybe this would be a principal agent problem or something like that, um, you know, where a private equity firm uh, gets the upside if things go well, but doesn't have to experience the downside if they go poorly. And to go back to your you know, examples that you were talking about, and it's not a perfect one-to-one -one comparison, but the advantage that you've got with these public companies is they ultimately are responsible for their own actions. If Exxon has the Exxon Valdez spill, Exxon has to pay out. The ironic thing is if a private equity firm has a tragedy at a nursing home or a, you know, one of its portfolio companies does something that breaks the law, even if the private equity firm was able to direct that operation, it won't necessarily have to pay out when things go badly. But I mean, isn't the same true with public companies, right? So I mean, if I'm a shareholder, uh, you know, I'm protected by the, the corporate veil, uh, regardless of my size. So, you know, Fidelity and, and, and BlackRock and State Street, you know, they own, I don't know, or at least, you know, they don't own, but they are in many ways um, in control of, you know, the vast majority of, of public companies to some degree. And, and they presumably also are, are limited from downside. The worst thing that can happen is, you know, their, their stake is, is, is wiped out. Is, is it really that, you, you know, the, the, these general partners are making decisions on behalf of the money that's provided by the, by the, by the limited partners? I mean, is this, cause you know, the other book that came out around the time of, you know, Brandeis is other people's money is, is, is brilliant means, right. And they were bemoaning the separation of, ownership and, and control. And, you know, the, the whole shareholder capitalism movement, which, you know, we've seen, th I think this is what you're describing as sort of the, the culmination of the kind of shareholder capital movement. It seems to have its roots, or at least they view Burley and Means as their, uh, their inspiration, right? And, and so some people would argue that, oh yeah, you know, private equity is a way of overcoming this separation of kind of ownership and, and control. Right. By by making sure that the you know, you don't have this independent group of managers that they're feathering their own nests. I mean, how yeah. would you how would you respond to that? Well, it's it's an interesting comparison because, you know, you're exactly right. The the advocates for the private equity industry basically say exactly what exactly that, that this is a solution to the ownership and control problem of the public markets. The challenge that you've got is you have a new separation of ownership and control with the private or in private equity markets in that oftentimes what will happen is uh, 
the general partner of the private equity firm will be able to op exert operational control through a limited partnership agreement to the fund that owns the assets. But then when things go wrong, uh, you know, they can walk away. At the risk of being repetitive, I'll just I'll give, go into one example here, and then I hopefully can touch on, I think you made a really interesting comparison to the public markets. Um, the whole book starts with this story about Carlisle's acquisition of HCR Manor Care, which is this nursing home chain um, that was absolutely gigantic in the 2000s. Um, Carlisle executed a lot of tactics that I think, um, you know, critics of private equity complain about, you know, whether you're talking about a sale leaseback of selling the, the nursing home's, you know, assets, um, extracting transaction fees and management fees, which the nursing home chain had to pay out for the privilege of being owned by the private equity firm. Um, and they slashed staffing. But when a resident of the facility died and their family, you know, because she had to go to the bathroom by herself, it's an understaffed facility, she hits her head on a bathroom fixture, dies of subdural hematoma. Um, when the family sues for wrongful death, Carlisle at that point says, we are not the technical owners of this situation, of this nursing home chain. We merely advise a series of funds whose limited partners through several shell companies own the nursing home chain. And that was enough to get the case against it dismissed. But, but it so, was nursing home, nursing home was judgment proof, right? Because it had, it was so highly levered, right? That was part of the problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, what you've got here is sort of a new ownership and control problem, which is you've got a new group of people who do have ownership or do have control, but not necessarily responsibility. To go back to, I think, what started out your question, which is, you know, you do have these massive investors in the public markets, Black, you know, BlackRock, State Street, um, Vanguard, and so forth. I think by some measure, these firms are the largest stockholder of in 95% of the S&P 500. That was, and that statistic was from three or four years ago, so I assume it's higher now. Um, but by being the largest owner, we're talking about a five, seven, eight percent ownership stake in these companies. And that's not to say that they can't exert tremendous influence over public companies, but you contrast that with definitionally sort of private ownership of these businesses where they're controlling 100% of the stake or a majority percentage of the stake. It, the, the, the levels of responsibility there, I think, are just quite different. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think, you know, your, your critique can, can be split into, into two parts, right? One part is that, you know, private equity does a great job of, you know, increasing the, the profitability of their, their portfolio companies, right? And pursuing that to the exclusion of other sorts of, of goals and not concerning themselves too much with these secondary impacts. But there's another critique, which is that they um, make these companies less profitable, Right, you know, by by running them into into bankruptcy, and and it seems like um, I mean, it seems like those are two separate things, right? I mean, in one case, you're you're creating a quote successful company, and in the other case, you're kind of, I guess, you know, presiding over the decline or destruction of of a company. How are those two things? I mean, can can we find something in common there? I mean, why 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 did you why why do you think both of those things are are potentially bad. Yeah, I and you're making your my argument better than I could. So let me let me try to split it maybe along a different axis and in, in, axis in two ways. So you know, one is that private equity firms are often able to get profits, but they're profits for the short term. You know, they they have to sell the company within the time frame of of the fund's existence generally. So you know, we're talking about just a few years. I always joke, you know, if I was trying to maximize the value of my apartment over 20 years, I'd redo the kitchen and add an inset bookcase. If I was trying to maximize the value over two weeks, I would burn it down and try to collect the insurance money. You know, the, the time frame that you've got for an investment changes your perspective on what you're gonna do with it, whether you're going to jack up prices for the short term, even if it means that you're gonna lose customers for the long term, you know, under invest in your employees and your innovation, even if it means that you know, you might be scooped by the competition in a few years and so forth. So I think that's one axis. I think another one, and hopefully this gets to the second part of your question here, is oftentimes private equity firms can succeed even when their fellow investors fail, even when their own portfolio companies mm -hmm. fail. Um, and this goes back to, you know, the fees that we were talking about earlier, you know, management fees, which is what a portfolio company will pay every year or every quarter for the privilege of being owned by the private equity firm. 
transaction fees, which are fees that a, a portfolio company will pay when it executes a big deal like selling its assets or so forth. These are fees that don't go to the other investors. They're not a payout from the investment. They're fees that go directly to the private equity firm. And what's really interesting is in story after story about you know, a big company failing under private equity ownership, oftentimes in the reporting, there's really interesting analysis, analysis saying like, look, maybe the investors lost out, but the private equity firm actually walked out ahead. Um, to go back to the manor care example we were talking about, um, Peter Wariski over in the Washington Post did great reporting on that story. And he found out that Carlisle essentially made its money back within the first couple years of the deal and then was essentially just sitting on a free business for itself. Um, similar things happened with, for instance, the, the collapse of Toys R Us, which was an acquisition by KKR, Bain, and Vernado. So I think that there are cases where private equity firms can win, the firms specifically, even if the portfolio companies fail. Now, do you think we need to maybe split up our concern between kind of the, I guess we'll call contract creditors and non-contract creditors? Because, right? I mean, if if people are buying the bonds, which ultimately default, I mean, it's hard to be kind of sympathetic to them. If if you're a limited partner and you, you, you get into a raw deal and the, the GPs you know, walk away with all the upside, I mean, it's also kind of hard to be sympathetic for them because they're also pretty sophisticated. Um, but, but then, you know, the other parties, the ones that like, if you are injured, uh, and, and you don't really have any recourse, um, you know, those, those people, I think we, we should be concerned about. I mean, is, is, is that a problem of, you know, leverage in, in general? Like, do we, should we be thinking about, um, I don't know, some kind of minimum capital requirement for, for all companies? Because look, in the public markets, we also have these share buybacks and, and a lot of people are concerned that share buybacks will, kind of, um, you know, gut the company and, and leave little behind for any kind of tort claimant. So if there's a big, you know, class action, they just, you know, walk away, right? I mean, is that, should should we be thinking about minimum capital requirements for, for non-financial companies as a way of, of protecting the interests of these, these, these non-contractual uh, creditors? You know, I think that's that's something that other people who are are much smarter on sort of banking regulations have talked about. Um, you know, I'm I'm a criminal and antitrust lawyer, so I my expertise is real limited here. I mean, one of the interesting things that's been going on, and you know, this is changing now that interest rates are are rising. But you know, we had this long period where, is you know, we had such cheap cash that the average debt levels for these acquisitions was just extraordinary. I saw one statistic float out there, I think, in 2021. I never saw it repeated, so I don't know how reliable it was, but they were saying that the average private equity acquisition, um, the, the valuation was 13 times EBITDA, which just seems extraordinary. Um, and you know, when you're dealing with mostly debt, mostly debt that the portfolio company is going to have to pay, um, you run a real risk of um, sort of structural instability in the economy. Um, one, one study out there suggests that private equity portfolio companies are 10 times as likely to go bankrupt as, um, as, companies that are, as similar companies that aren't owned by private equity. And so I think that would be an argument for you know, whether it's imposing capital requirements or limiting um, you know, lending in you know, extremely high leverage situations. Or you know, I'm a lawyer, so every, every, uh, everything I see is a nail and I've got a hammer. You know, making sure that liability extends to the, you know, GPs or the LPs here in a situation where they essentially should know the kinds of risks that they're creating. Right. And, you know, of course, this whole GPLP model, I mean, we see it in venture capital as well. And, you, you know, you, did, you didn't really critique venture capital. Um, do you think that that structure is, is better suited for, I mean, because, look, they have the same problem they invest for just a couple of years and you know their goal is to have an exit right and their goal is to sell their stake for more than what they paid for it um and and so you know would would we have any reason to think that's kind of more of a problem for a, a mature company than for a uh, you know early stage company i don't know I, I i haven't dug deeply into the vc world maybe that'll be the topic for a second book so i don't think i can give any smart answers there mm-hmm and um, so I, I want to get into this this idea of of, of bankruptcy a little more because I know you, you don't do bankruptcy, but there, there was you know a big part of the story was 
about how these companies will offload, particularly their pension liabilities, onto the the government, right? Through, and you know, I find this to be interesting because what you'll have is you'll have folks investing in both the debt and the equity, which will then give them the ability to sort of orchestrate a a bankruptcy without without losing control. Um, and so, you know, does the, the pension benefit guarantee corporation? I mean, have, have there been any proposals to, you know, change that law? Because presumably if all the pensions were pre-funded and uh, there was enough in, in the in the pension fund to cover all the liabilities, then, then this wouldn't be a problem, right? So so why why isn't ERISA kind of, kind of you know, structured so as to prevent this kind of... Because the real problem is, off, like with the banks, it's about, you know, getting the upside, offloading the downside, not to other private parties, but to, to the public sector. Yeah. So just to set this up, you're exactly right in sort of what's been going on here. So um, we've got a number of cases where private equity firms have bought up businesses, um, but weren't just the business's largest owner, um, they were also the largest lender. And the idea being, you know, in a bankruptcy, oftentimes it's sort of a, bit, a little bit like an hourglass, you know. Originally you start off with the owners at the top, lenders at the bottom, the hourglass glass kind of flips, and then oftentimes the lenders are able to take, take ownership of the company or its assets. Um, but when private equity firms are sort of on both ends of the hourglass, they're able to sell a business from itself to itself, um, which is sort of this magical sort of legal game that, that we're able to play. And the advantage of doing that is you can then off, off, uh, offload various liabilities, in particular, as you mentioned, pension liabilities onto others. Um, the pension liabilities get, abs get absorbed by what's called the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation, which is this quasi-government agency that pays for underfunded pension funds. Um, it's essentially supported by other more responsible companies and pension plans. Um, and this is a move that's been done, according to one Harvard study, you know, dozens of times. And, you know, you mentioned sort of the outset of this interview, this quote about private equity leaders saying, we don't make the rules. Um, that was specifically um, in this scenario when Sun Capital executed exactly this move on the diner chain friendlies. Um, the co-founder of Sun Capital was asked sort of, did he feel some sort of responsibility to the business, to the retirees and so forth? He said, you know, quote, we don't make the rules. Um, so it's an interesting case where I think private equity firms have demonstrated a real expertise, maybe not necessarily in running a business and sort of the operations of it, but really understanding um, sort of the possibilities and the limits or the, the lack of limits in the bankruptcy system. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you point out that, you know, private equity tends to show up whenever there is a, a company that is um, – you know, going out of business, right? <laughs> a lot of, a lot of, a lot of private equity. I mean, you know, you cite to Toys R Us, for instance, is an example that I talk about in, in my class a, a lot. Um, but, you know, couldn't it just be that, 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 you know, they're the ones that are in the business of trying to save companies that are on their way out. And so you're going to, you're going to see a lot more of them in the declining industries. Um, you know, I remember when hospitals were, were being raided for, um, uh, surgical outcomes, you know, Stanford was always at the at the bottom of the list because they would always take the most difficult patients, right? The ones with all the complications. So couldn't it just be that, you know, private equity, you know, it's like a hospital. And so, you know, they're taking in a lot of sick patients and, uh, and, and so you're going to see a higher mortality rate, you know, in their, in their portfolio than you might in say uh, a portfolio of public companies. That's certainly the argument that, that the private equity advocates make, um, and it's understandable for exactly what you say. I'd go back to the study that I referenced earlier about you know, 10x bankruptcies in portfolio companies. Um, these were not sort of you know, random portfolio companies compared to random non-private equity-owned companies. They, the, the economists who designed this really tried to find comparable kinds of companies that are similarly situated. So we have at least one study out there suggesting that you know, it's not just that they're going after um, tough businesses. It's that whatever the business happens to be, it's more likely that the private equity firm is going to push it into bankruptcy. And then so you've got some em empirical evidence here. 
I think you've also got a mechanism that helps to explain it, which is, you know, to go back to what we were talking about earlier, is the reliance on debt for the acquisition. Um, and if it's if it's debt that only the private equi- that, that only the portfolio company needs to worry about, um, you're putting these companies in a situation where they really have to succeed and have to succeed very quickly, or they're going into bankruptcy. Now, a lot of the book covers uh, sectors like healthcare and prisons. Right, and, and nursing homes. And, you know, when, when you read about the activities and outcomes <laughs> that, you know, you describe, I mean, it's, it's kind of, uh, it's, there's, there's definitely a lot of disturbing examples. Now, is, is part of the problem just private ownership in, in general or pr- involvement of the, of the private sector in general, like privatizing maybe some of these, like, prison activities ought to be sort of, under the review of the, the the government and um maybe private folks should not be involved i mean is is it or is it more about the the ownership of the the private entities that are that are involved in this yeah i think i think it's you know arguably both so just to set the stage here private equity firms have been enormously involved in um the prison services industry so um whether you're talking about prison healthcare um prison food and com- cafeteria and commissaries, um, prison phone services, um, prison debit cards. So back in the day, if you got a DUI and you know had to spend the night in jail and had 50 bucks in your wallet, um, the jail would take your wallet and give, you back, give it back to you in the morning with the 50 bucks in it. Um, now they give you a debit card that nominally has the $50 in it, but the card has a activation fee, a activity fee, an inactivity fee, a... Um, a, uh, a, a charge to find out how much money you have, et cetera, et cetera. Essentially, it's just a, it's a way to extract money from the folks that end up in jail. Um, private equity firms have been getting involved in that business as well. So sort of across the prison services industry, um, PE firms have been very active, and I, I think the outcomes have been extremely poor. I won't go through the whole litany, but you know, one that sticks with me is when you're talking about prison healthcare companies, um, you have private equity owned firms that are so understaffed that a woman had to give birth uh, in her ja- in a jail cell by herself. Um, you can imagine how traumatic that would be. Or in prison uh, cafeterias, uh, there have been allegations in multiple prisons um, that firms have been serving meat that's literally labeled on the box, not fit for human consumption. So to get back to your original question, you know, is this a problem of private involvement in the prison industry generally, or is there something unique about prisons specifically? I definitely think that there are challenges with any pri- private involvement um, in the prison system generally, because you know the, they have a profit motive and you have a literally captive audience, so you can increase prices or cut the quality of care, essentially with, with abandon. Um, I also and and prisoners don't have a whole lot of uh, leverage with their, their Congress people. Very little leverage. Um, and so... But, you know, I think that there is something unique about private equity firms, partly because I think they've been so effective um, in lobbying. Um, and I, it's something that we didn't get into detail in the book, but there's a lot of examples of private equity portfolio companies and firms getting involved in a lot of these debates on, on lobbying issues. But also, at the risk of being a broken record, um, it, it goes back to the liability issue. Um, it is already extremely hard um, to hold... Uh, prison service services providers legally responsible for their actions. So um, there are a lot of prisoner lawsuits alleging, you know, look, you're, there was there were roaches in my food, or you know, I almost died because of certain care and things like that. Because of both constitutional and statutory um, rules, it's very hard to get at the at the specific company. And then to go back to the corporate veil piercing, it becomes even harder to hold the private equity firm responsible. So I think it, in some ways, just exacerbates the principal agent problem that we've got, or it's, it's a more extreme for, form of the principal agent problem that we have across the private equity industry. Well, do you think there's another difference? I mean, public companies are required to disclose a whole lot more, right? And so so the public can see, you know, they have a little bit of window and a little bit of visibility into what's going on. And it also opens up the door to, you know, pressure by by shareholders, right? So <clears throat> although there's lots of studies that show that screening in different investment funds has minimal impact, 
But, you know, if you're a shareholder, you can express a voice, right? And so if you find something uh, offensive or objectionable, you know, you can, you can input your, your voice. And so having a broader group of folks who, who own stock in the enterprise, you know, perhaps m- maybe makes these managers a little bit uh, more reluctant to engage in behaviors that, that, that don't, don't have good optics. I mean, is, is, that, is that part of it? I mean, is there a way that shareholders can put pressure on publicly traded companies through ESG initiatives and so forth, and the public companies really aren't, you know, answerable to anybody? I mean, yes, the, the LPs, and I've seen a lot of, so I do a lot of work with, with pension funds, public pension funds, and certainly they're more and more curious about the, the impact of the activities of the, the GPs they invest with? Yeah. It's a great question. And I think it, the, the structure of private equity kind of cuts in both directions. Um, one direction is exactly what you said, which is almost by definition, um, private equity firms are less transparent than public companies. And so it's harder to track who owns what and who's responsible for whom. Um, I think that's been a real challenge for people that have been trying to um, make some progress on these issues. I think the surprising thing is because private equity firms tend to get their investments, their investment money from a limited number of pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, you know, high net worth individuals, if you can figure out what's going on, it's kind of paradoxically a little easier to pressure them sometimes. Um, and I think we've seen examples of that specifically in prison services. Um, there's an organization called Worth Rises that has been advocating for sort of fair fees for making calls from prisons, um, has just been enormously successful on this issue by pressuring specific pension funds to limit their investments in these firms that are making these, that are buying these businesses. So I think on the one hand, it's harder to figure out what's going on with private equity firms. On the other hand, if you can figure it out, in some ways, it's a little easier sometimes to get traction than with public companies. I mean, do you think the the fact that the so many of the LPs are, you know, public employees, right? I mean, the, yes, of course, the, the, the GPs are people who are making millions, if not billions of dollars. But the, you know, the GPs are often school teachers, you know, firefighters, police officers. D- does that sort of impact the political economy to some degree and, and, and maybe, you know, make it easier for, for private equity to um, inject their opinions into the, the public discussions? Well, I, that's an interesting question. I, on the one hand, w- when we're talking about prison services, I think that the LPs, you know, who are working on behalf of the firefighters or the teachers or whatever it happens to be, I think have been really receptive to... Um, uh, to the arguments of activists saying, you know, I think because they they believe in government service and government efficiency and things like that, um, and I think have been very effective there. Um, on the other hand, if I'm understanding your question correctly, um, I think it has been a very powerful tool for the private equity industry to say we are, you know, merely working on behalf of, you know, you know, pension fund, you know, pension holders, you know, the, the doctors and lawyers, or no, not doctors and lawyers, the teachers and firefighters and so forth um, that we serve. And I think that that has been um, a very strong argument when they're trying to make, you know, their case, uh, you know, in Congress and in state houses. Right. Now, I, wanna, I do want to turn to the lobbying question because, I mean, I think the, the problem that um, the trust busters had, right, Back in the day, what wasn't simply that they had a problem with large economic enterprises, right? I mean, it's certainly part of it, but you know, there were a lot of companies that were big and that were actually benefiting the consumer in, in a lot of ways. And yet, there was still quite a bit of objection. And I think the objection was that you know, the bigger you are in the private sector, the more of an impact you can have on the private sector, on the public sector. So, yes, you don't make the rules, but you can have a big impact on what those rules look like. So, uh, you know, when you're describing sort of how private equity groups influence the political process, one of the things that that strikes me is why are our congressmen so cheap? I mean, (laughs) you know, like, I mean, $10,000 here and $20,000 there. 
I mean, you'd think that wouldn't really make a huge impact, but I mean, that's going to have a bigger ROI than, than, you know, pretty much any other $10,000 you're going to spend, right? Well, I, I can't talk to any specific congressperson or anything like that, but I'll, I'll say in the ag aggregate, I think private equity firms have just been perhaps unequaled in their success in lobbying. Um, you know, when you're talking about, I believe, over $900 million spent on federal elected, uh, on contributions to federal elected officials and candidates and so forth over the past few decades, um, that money goes far. And I think more than just the money, you have a very deep bench of people that are working on behalf of private equity firms. You know, um, three secretaries of the Treasury, secretaries of state, defense, um, uh, two former speakers of the House, former chair people of the SEC and FCC, you know, senators, congressmen. Um, it's, it's a really long list of people that are now advocating on behalf of the industry. And I think that they've been pretty extraordinarily successful on the specific issues they care about. You know, the carried interest loophole, which has sort of become this totem of the issue. Um, you know, we've had the last three presidents um, try to get rid of the carried interest loophole, um, and all of them have failed, um, which gives you a sense, you know, the combined force of three presidents over, you know, two parties and, you know, going on, what, 15 years now, um, haven't been able to solve this one tax issue. Um, suggests that the private equity firms have just been sort of astoundingly successful. Well, let's dig into that carried interest loophole because I think most people are unaware of, you know, how this actually works and how it basically results in some of the wealthiest people in America having some of the lowest uh, tax rates. I mean, I've had some private equity colleagues trying to recruit me saying, you know, come and join us. Um, can't beat the carried interest tax loophole, right? And so, um, so, you know, tell us a bit about kind of how, how that works and stays in place. Yep. So, you know, a private equity executive, his, you know, the, the simplified model is that the private equity firm is compensated on a 2 in 20 model. So 2% of the profits above a certain threshold and 20% um, uh, of the profits above a certain threshold and 2% of the assets under management every year. Um, and the carried interest loophole uh, has it basically says that both of those should be treated as um, a capital gains rather than as ordinary income. And capital gains is taxed at a lower interest rate than ordinary income. And that's pretty much all the money that a private equity executive typically makes. And so what that means is that leaders of private equity firms historically have paid a lower tax rate um, than, you know, the, the firefighters and teachers that they, you know, nominally serve. Um, so it's been a it's been a pretty powerful loophole. It sort of gained public um, uh, prominence in about 2007, um, as I as I mentioned earlier, President Obama, but when he was a senator, campaigned against it. President Trump um, opposed it as well, and uh, President Biden uh, opposed it in his uh, I think first budget. Um, none of them has succeeded, and it's really interesting. You listen to the commentary of sort of the presidential advisors on this stuff. Um, after the fact, after these budget negotiations and so forth, there's a, almost a sense of sort of um, uh, stunned awe uh, uh, when they're talking about the lobbying effort around this, saying, you know, we're, we're just not able to move forward on this. Um, so I think that's, that's one area where I think private equity firms have been successful, but it, it certainly isn't the only one. Well, what's astonishing about that is, um, I mean, this is a relatively small group of people, right? <laughs> And so, you know, presumably they, they shouldn't have that, that much, much clout. Um, well, it's a small group of people, but several of them have net worths that are larger than the GDPs of medium-sized countries. So, um, you know, I think uh, uh, the largest private equity executives have, you know, GDPs that are bigger than, you know, the country of Georgia and Bhutan and things like that, if I'm remembering correctly. So uh, they can wield an awful lot of influence. Mm-hmm. Now, another thing that you, you talk about is how, you know, especially since Dodd-Frank, um, you know, the most lucrative jobs out there for people interested in finance are no longer with the investment banks, right? I mean, yes, of course, $24 million. I don't know what Jamie Dimon makes. I, I don't know what the CEO of Goldman Sachs makes. $24, $25, $30, $40 million. Sounds like an awful lot of money for, you know, a professor, or, you know, a prosecutor. But I mean, it's chump change, right? Compared to what you can make if you if you go into private equity. Yeah, the year I measured it, which I think was 2021, uh, the CEO of 
Goldman Sachs made about one tenth the amount of the leader of, of Blackstone. So, um, you know, the CEO of Goldman Sachs is is not terribly underpaid. Um, so I think that that you know, if you're a young person looking to make an enormous amount of money, um, private equity more than the investment banks might be the place to go. Um, I think it's interesting, you know, um, a lot of this I think can be traced back to 2008. Um, you know, in the financial crisis, all the big investment banks converted into bank holding companies where they're regulated under the Federal Reserve and just are, are subject to much more stringent requirements. And I think sort of institutionally became much less um, interesting organizations um, uh, are ju were just doing a lot less. And a lot of the sort of financial innovation, for better or worse, sort of shifted to private equity firms. Um, and as a result, there's this one quote from an analyst that I keep coming back to. I, I, I'm paraphrasing it slightly. Um, but he said something along the lines of, um, Blackstone reminds me of Goldman Sachs 10 years ago. You know, wherever something interesting is happening, that's where they are. Mm -hmm. uh, and you see that play out in the statistics about who works for these firms. I, I, I'm mangling the numbers here, but, um, you know, it, uh, so th this isn't exactly right, but it was something like, 20% of people at Blackstone had previously worked at Goldman Sachs, whereas 2% of people at Goldman Sachs previously worked at Blackstone. So it suggests that sort of the, the, all the energy is going from investment banks to private equity firms and not the other way around. Well, you know, towards the end of the book, you come up with a whole bunch of reform proposals. And, and what's interesting about the reform proposals is that the, the majority of them are not specifically around private equity, right? They're about you know, flaws in all sorts of aspects of our, our legal system or enforcement system. And so in a way, like private equity, you can think of private equity as sort of the, the magnifying glass, right? Or the, you know, the, the, the stress testers, that they're pushing the boundaries of uh, our, our laws in, in a bunch of different domains. So, you know, maybe if you're a reformer, just follow the private equity folks around, see where they're going next, and that's probably going to give you, you know, point out some kind of um, some kind of weakness. So uh, can maybe walk through some of these because you, you describe the, the role of different enforcement agencies in different parts of, of the government, you know, starting with DOJ and FTC, right, which, you know, know best. And then moving on Department of Labor and, you know, FCC and Department of Education, SEC, et cetera. So could, could maybe walk through some of those, starting with with your own. Uh, department. Do, do you think that the, the new kind of revival of kind of antitrust and enforcement um, is a move in the right direction? I mean, it seems like most of the prosecutions have been going after just like big tech companies and publicly traded tech companies and haven't been uh, targeting this, this sort of new conglomerate form called private equity. Yeah, and, and here I have to be somewhat circumspect because, uh, you know, I, I still work at DOJ um, and would like to continue to work there. So I'll, I'll talk only at a high level about that, and then I can perhaps talk on, about some of the other um, areas of reform. So as you said, you know, there really has been a revival in antitrust, I think, in the last few years. It has been largely focused on sort of big publicly traded companies for the most part. But you have seen really innovative work happening around private equity specifically. Um, just last week, I believe, uh, the FTC filed a lawsuit against U.S. anesthesiology partners um, and its private equity owner for a roll-up that was going on um, of anesthesiology practices, I believe, in Texas. Um, there was a similar um, consent decree entered for private equity roll-ups of veterinary clinics and so forth. So I think you are seeing some regulatory action happen. At so, so to be fair, so to be clear, like when you do a roll up, right, there, there are a couple different motivations. One motivation might be, hey, we can, you know, standardize practices and disseminate best practices and we can provide sort of, a, you know, back end, you know, IT integration, all that stuff, which would en enhance the, the value creation of this industry. Then the other part is, well, now we can eliminate competition, right, and we can you know, fix pricing and, and so forth. And so it's, it's, it's the latter that, that you're going after. I mean, is, is there a way that we can um, preserve the, the, the bathwater without tossing out the baby? Um, yeah. So I, sadly, I guess that's pretty much what every, um, antitrust, every antitrust case is about, right? Yeah. yeah. So I'm trying to think of the, the simple way to summarize it. I think, you know, 
the, the general way to look at it is, you know, the way antitrust cases normally work is you define a geographic and a product market. So to go back to anesthesiology, is, or I'll just, I'll do a hypothetical. If you want to do dermatology practices in Florida, you know, if a private equity firm was rolling up dermatology practices, you'd say, okay, what's the geographic market? It's probably a few metropolitan areas. Um, what's the product market? It's, you know, listed dermatology services. And is this roll-up, if you, if you want to take sort of the, the most narrow, conservative interpretation of antitrust laws, looking at how this is structured, looking at what their plans are, looking at how much market share they have, um, looking at the specific practices of this industry, um, are prices likely to rise for consumers? And if they are likely to rise, then, you know, potentially that acquisition or proposed acquisition could be enjoined under Section 7 of the Clayton Act. There's other sort of ways that you can look at, you know, to go back to the baby and bathwater about, you know, how do you how do you preserve the right mix here? You know, other things that you might be looking at are um, employee pay and retention. You know, is this the kind of roll up where it means that the doctors in Tampa are going to have nowhere else to go or, you know, or the nurses in Clearwater are going to have no options but to accept pay cuts um, or looking at innovation? Is this the kind of thing that. Um, ultimately is going to reduce the quality of care or reduce, you know, sort of R&D in the industry. So I, that, that's an abbreviated antitrust 101 for, uh, for your listeners, but that's generally how um, uh, plaintiffs, whether it's the government or private plaintiffs, sort of look at these cases. Now, you, in addition to talking about what regulators can do, um, both federal and state, you know, a lot, of, a lot of things, a lot of the problems seem to come out of private law, right, or come out of corporate law or, you know, come out of, you know, the kind of law that, that isn't necessarily designed by or enforced by federal agencies. I mean, do, do we need to, you know, fundamentally rethink kind of those aspects of, of private law? And, you know, for instance, I guess I don't know what this is quite private law, but for instance, arbitration provisions, mm -hmm. right? You, you talk a lot about them. And, uh, and, and so, you know, private equity is a big proponent of arbitration. I mean, I guess any corporation is a proponent of, of, of arbitration. Have, have we taken arbitration too far? I mean, do we need to scrutinize these arbitration provisions? Well, the challenge that you've got with arbitration provisions is it, it, really, it, it really dissociates ownership from responsibility here. Um, and, you know, to go back to, the, to sort of what we were started talking about uh, at the outset of this interview around nursing homes, um, arbitration has been just going gangbusters in that industry. And it means not only is it going to be hard for a family to pursue justice if their family member dies or is hurt because they're going to have to go through this expensive process, oftentimes putting up fees at the outset um, to go through it. It means that even if they win, oftentimes they're going to have to sign an NDA. And there's going to be no positive case law developed around the case that future, that, that future plaintiffs can rely on. Um, so what that means is I think we've got an area where um, – you know, companies in general, but private equity firms, which I think have been extremely aggressive in using uh, arbitration, are really making it very hard to develop the law in a way for, you know, both for their benefit and both for plaintiff's benefits um, to, to ultimately sort of make sure that the right people are being held responsible for wrongdoing. To go back to, I think, your, your original question about sort of how do we need to rethink this, um, you know, it's unlikely that federal legislation on arbitration is going to happen anytime soon. That's not an issue that I, I study closely, so I can't speak to that. The Supreme Court has interpreted arbitration uh, agreements very expansively, um, essentially allowing companies to, to basically dictate the terms of these things. Um, so to the extent that there's going to be action here, I think it's probably going to be action by state legislatures, um, looking at how can we make sure that s businesses in our area that are either, you know, just private businesses or are owned by private equity firms um, don't take unfair advantage of, you know, residents, of customers, of clients, whoever it happens to be, um, you know, if something goes wrong at their business. Now look, I mean, I think one of the, the ways in which we could explain the rise of private equity is this kind of low interest rate environment that we've had for the last couple decades. And I've had other podcasts on this where, you know, this low interest rate environment has um, accelerated inequality in, in America, right? Most of the benefits of the leverage have accrued to people who are um, already fairly wealthy, you know, equity holders in particular. Um, do you think that, that, that that's something which will draw to a close? I mean, now that we're seeing higher interest rates, will this, 
result in a retrenchment of of, of private equity. Um, I mean, should we be thinking when we are thinking about kind of our interest rate policies, should we be thinking about kind of the impact that they have on the distribution of income, you know, who benefits and who, who's harmed? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm not an economist, but it certainly seems like we should be looking at, you know, not just, you know, how do we grow the GDP as big as possible, but, you know, is the GDP going to be controlled overwhelmingly by a handful of folks or, you know, are we going to have sort of the broad-based prosperity that we all celebrate from the 1950s and so forth. Um, so I th certainly think that's something to consider. In terms of whether, whether this is coming to an end, you know, I, I read the same newspapers that everybody else does, and it seems like a lot of private equity funds are, you know, starting to have some problems here. Um, you know, they really banked on the idea of sort of endless low interest rate environments, and now that that's not happening, you're seeing, you know, limitations on withdrawals in some funds and so forth. Whether that sort of metastasizes into a full-blown blown crisis is, you know, for other people to, to decide. Um, I think what's interesting is, um, to go back to your point about how private equity, you know, it used to be called leverage buyouts, and then there was sort of a rebranding a few decades ago. Um, you know, that's happening again right now. You know, they're no longer called private equity firms. They're called alternative asset managers. And I think part of that is is an underlying factual change that, what we call private equity firms are increasingly no longer just doing private equity. Um, you know, whether it's insurance, infrastructure, uh, private credit, and so forth. You know, for a lot of these firms, quote unquote, private equity is a minority of their business now. So, whether or not these new interest rates are going to sort of fundamentally harm private equity firms or I think maybe it's more likely they're just going to evolve into sort of new and disparate lines of business. Right. And, and you point out that, you know, none of them are considered SIFIs, right? None of them are considered, um, you know, so important that they have to be subject to extra scrutiny or, or, or regulation. I mean, have we sort of taken a lot of the risks that used to be in the regulated financial sector and, and moved them into an unregulated financial sector. Can, can you imagine a scenario where the activities of one of these private equity companies through their private lending might lead to some kind of crisis? Well, that's what, you know, some commentators are saying is already happening when you're talking about some of these real estate, you know, real estate investments. And I certainly think that um, as private equity firms expand to sort of ever more innovative businesses, um, one of the areas that I'm really concerned about is insurance, where you've got private equity firms buying up insurance companies and insurance policies, moving those to offshore affiliates in Bermuda, where they've got lower capital requirements. Um, you know, that creates, gives them more money to play with, but it gives them less, less of a cushion if things go wrong. And I think the thing that really concerns me about this industry is it's possible that if some of these insurance funds and companies that are private equity owned um, become insolvent, it's not necessarily the case that the private equity firm is going to have to pay out. Um, rather, the state guarantee corporations, which insure insurers in each state, um, may have to take on responsibility for um, you know paying out to for these insolvent insurance policies, rather than the private equity firm. So it's sort of yet another example of where a private equity firm is benefiting when things go well, but potentially is going to get to walk away if and when things go badly. Yeah, it's kind of the Warren Buffett uh, model. Yeah, and I don't think a lot of these state regulators have the sophistication. Perhaps the New York state regulators are fairly sophisticated, but um, folks in other states might not be. Um, perhaps one day we'll have a national regulatory infrastructure for, for insurance. Yeah. Brennan, thanks so much for joining me. I appreciate it. The book is called uh, Plunder, Private Equities Plan to Pillage America. Look at this cover. It's, pr it's pretty wild. We've got the, 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 the pirate on the front of it. Um, so hopefully we'll, we'll chat again soon. Look forward to the next book. Thank you so much for having me. Unsiloed Podcast is produced by University FM, elevating the stories of your institution 